Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm the Shoal Chair in International Business. Thanks for attending uh, our Asia Architecture Conference. I want to welcome you on behalf of CSIS and uh, my colleagues, Ernie Bauer, the Sumitra Chair in East Asia Studies, and Matt Goodman, the Simon Chair in Political Economy. We're delighted you're here today, and we also want to extend a welcome to those viewing the, via the live webcast. This entire event will be webcast live and available on the C at CSIS.org following the, uh, the uh, event. Also want to let you know that uh, you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag CSIS Live. That's hashtag CSIS Live. Those of you in the room, probably I'd prefer not to have you follow us on Twitter. I'd like to have you put your phones on silent. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. In any case, uh, thanks for coming and uh, uh, being part of this. We want to extend a particular uh, note of thanks to our sponsors, the Center for Responsible and Enterprise and Trade, and the National Center for APEC for their uh, generous support for today's conference. I also want to call your attention to a working paper that was circulated as you came in entitled Enhancing Value Chains and Agenda for APEC. This is a working paper that's been produced by uh, uh, the, uh, my colleague Matt Goodman and myself. Uh, and uh, we would welcome your thoughts and advice on this paper uh, either today or later. You're welcome to contact us. Today's discussion and conference proceedings will be incorporated in a final publication later this fall. So uh, we, we thank you for your interest and welcome your input uh, to, uh, to our uh, analysis of value chains in East Asia. To start today's meeting, and in fact, to, to introduce today's uh, first speaker, I'd like to uh, welcome Monica Whaley, president of the National Center of APEC, uh, our, our partner for this event. Uh, the National Center for APEC is the secretariat for U.S. APEC Business Advisory Council, the, the, uh, the business voice of APEC and ha has been the voice of APEC in the United States for a number of years. Monica herself has ably served as president of the National Center since 2009, but her affiliation with the National Center goes back to its founding in 1994. Please welcome Monica Whaley. Thanks, Scott. He's taller than I am. Thank you, Scott, for the great introduction. I appreciate that. Um, as Scott mentioned, the National Center is the secretariat for the three U.S. members of the APEC Business Advisory Council. Uh, and these are three executives who are appointed by the President of the United States to serve in the capacity of, of, of the three U.S. representatives on a um, 21 economy grouping that has... Um, the, the responsibility of looking at APEC's agenda and providing feedback uh, on it. And so in that capacity, the National Center has had the pleasure of working with, uh, with our next speaker, uh, Bart Peterson from Eli Lilly. Bart is the uh, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Communications at Eli Lilly. And in late 2012, he was appointed by the White House to serve on the APEC Business Advisory Council. Uh, at Lilly, Bart serves as a member of the company's executive committee while overseeing the firm's state, federal, and international government affairs efforts. Bart and his team are responsible for everything from public policy planning and development to corporate social responsibility, anti-counterfeiting, and community and public relations. Uh, and reading from his bio and talking with Bart, just about everything in between all those, those areas. Uh, prior to joining Lilly in uh, June of 2009, Bart served in distinguished leadership roles in both the public and private sectors, including from 2000 to 2007 when he served two terms as the mayor of Indianapolis, the nation's 12th largest city. So ABAC provides private sector input to the government APEC process, and, and Bart's been playing a real leadership role with, uh, in moving these uh, U.S. issues onto the ABAC agenda. Uh, it provides critical advice on a broad range of issues, and having such an experienced and capable business executive on the council as Bart means that U.S. business interests are being well represented in APEC. Um, and Bart's experience and, and background as a public official has been a real bonus for us as well. Um, and he brings particular experience in the life sciences and health field to, to ABAC, which is a field that's very interested in pursuing. Uh, he's raised the profile of health on the ABAC agenda, and no small feat for a new member uh, navigating the sometimes uh, opaque nature of ABAC. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Bart Peterson. Bart, we look forward to hearing your insights as a member of the APEC Business Advisory Council. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. I appreciate the kind introduction. And I just want to say that the National Center for APEC is really a, a great champion for U.S. business in the Asia Pacific region. So good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I want to first thank CSIS for hosting us this morning, and in particular, Scott Miller and Matt Goodman and Ernie Bauer for their leadership in putting together this timely conference on Asia. I also want to acknowledge the distinguished participants today, including ambassadors and senior members of the diplomatic corps. We are in the middle of what some might call summit season. Leaders from the G20 nations and uh, leaders from G20 met in St. Petersburg last week and discussed issues such as anti-corruption, financial regulatory reform, and global tax policies. And now the nations of the Asia-Pacific region turn their collective attention to the APEC leaders meeting in Bali and the East Asia Summit meeting in Brunei, which are both less than one month away. In the midst of the flurry of activity that surrounds all of these gatherings, it's important, I think, to take a step back and consider the value that these multilateral institutions bring to various stakeholders in the member countries. From today's agenda, you'll see that there's an excellent lineup of experts uh, at this gathering who will provide perspectives on how APEC and the EAS are being used to develop a shared economic and security policy in the Asia Pacific region. I'm here to provide a business perspective on today's discussion. Specifically, I'd like to talk about APEC's value to a multi, as a multilateral forum and the unique mechanism that APEC has for incorporating business views into governmental deliberations. Since its inception in 1989, APEC has worked to reduce tariffs and other trade barriers across Asia Pacific, encouraging efficient domestic economies and dramatically increasing exports. APEX membership, which includes some of the world's most dynamic economies, accounts for approximately 41% of the world's population, 54% of the world's GDP, and 44% of the world's trade. And according to some estimates, APEC economies have generated 195 million new jobs and 70% of the overall increase in global economic growth in the past decade. From the U.S. perspective, nearly 60% of U.S. exports go to APEC economies, and seven of America's top 15 trading partners are in APEC. At a micro level, we certainly are witnessing this growth at Lilly, which is why our company is now facing east more than it has in its entire 137-year history. Now, inherent in the dynamism of APEX member economies is a constantly changing business environment. The emergence of new technologies and new middle and upper income consumers has spurred companies to respond with new products and services and, often, new business models. Meanwhile, governments typically respond to change with new policies and regulations to make sure the growth works for their people. The business community seeks to partner with the government to ensure that these policies provide protections and opportunities for citizens, yes, but also facilitate trade and investment. One example from Lilly's sector is the efficient and safe supply of medicines. This entails a complex web of regulations including supply chain standards, increasingly sophisticated regulatory approval requirements, and manufacturing inspection regimes. And so it's precisely at this point when new business models and new regulations are in the nascent stages of development that APEX structure enables it to be the most effective as the public and the private sector's partner to find solutions that work for all stakeholders. In fact, this is what makes APEC so unique. One of APEC's key strengths is its convening power, which includes the private sector as a meaningful voice within APEC. When a new issue is on the horizon 
and governments need to talk about it, APIC is the place they can do it with all stakeholders, including the private sector. So for example, when SARS struck in early 2003, APEC health ministers met to discuss the economic and trade impacts of the outbreak, as well as the health impacts. APEC has responded to food safety and disaster preparedness issues as well. There are also ongoing sector-specific dialogues to enhance effective public policy. In our sector, it is the Life Sciences Innovation Forum, which is actually a tripartite collaboration among industry, government, and academia. The Life Sciences Innovation Forum advances key health priorities ranging from biotech investment to public health threats like non-communicable diseases. So I'm honored to contribute to this important process through my current role as a U.S. representative on the APEC Business Advisory Council, which is also known, as you heard, as ABAC, alongside my colleague Ed Rapp, who is the group president of Caterpillar. ABAC is an all-private sector body consisting of three executives. The U.S. is uh, soon to have a third executive, um, representing each of APEC's 21 economies. They're also asked by their governments to serve as representatives of their respective business communities and to develop policy recommendations for officials. From the business point of view, ABAC has leveraged APEC's unique flexible structure to highlight a number of issues that have arisen in our dynamic business environment, including the impact that innovation policy has on trade policy, regulatory coherence, secure and efficient supply chains, and foreign direct investment and infrastructure investment, just uh, infrastructure development, just as a few examples. So while APEC is not a forum for negotiating binding agreements, it is an ideal place to raise and discuss emerging issues in a collegial environment where governments do not need to worry about quid pro quo or giving up too much to a trading partner in a negotiation. With the Business Advisory Council as the official mechanism for private sector input into APEC, it's a valuable forum for maintaining the ongoing dialogue with governments. Dialogue that ensures the public sector understands how government regulations and policies affect the way businesses operate today. So all this sounds great, but you must be wondering, where does all this talk lead to? Well, it does lead to change, not necessarily in the form of drastic policy reforms, but rather changes that are more gradual and become apparent in long-term trends. One example I'll point to here is APEC's work on corruption. In the early days of APEC, the word corruption came nowhere near the annual statements released by leaders and ministers. However, over time, APEC has adopted a robust work plan to promote anti-corruption efforts in the region. APEC now provides one of the only networks in the region for government officials to collaborate on these efforts. And what makes this effort more meaningful is its ongoing engagement with the private sector, which is particularly critical in this area. In the biotech sector, APEC adopted the so-called Mexico City principles, which seek to require APEC economies to adopt ethical codes of conduct. In fact, a region-wide training on these principles occurred only last month in at a meeting in Kuala Lumpur hosted by the Malaysian Prime Minister. Furthermore, APEC has played an integral role in shaping the trade debate and developing the structural framework for future agreements in the region, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. We've been told by our colleagues in government that when the initial TPP negotiations began with nine countries, they looked to APEC as a starting point for negotiations, which they all could agree upon. For those of us who have invested so much time and energy into APEC, it's very gratifying to see APEC's non-binding best practices and guidelines being codified in an important binding agreement like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I think this is one excellent example of how the Business Advisory Council's input into APEC influences economic policies in the region. We essentially provide the building blocks to governments in the form of recommendations and let them use these in developing 
economic or trade policy either unilaterally or through international agreements. In early October, I'll join my ABAC colleagues to f in face-to-face -face meetings with officials and heads of state at APEC Leaders Week in Bali. We'll discuss how we can work or how they can work with the business community to advance a number of key issues, including healthcare investment, secure and resilient supply chains, and steps needed to address infrastructure gaps in the region. The upcoming APEC host years in China and the Philippines in 2014 and 2015, respectively, will prove to be valuable opportunities uh, for further public-private cooperation on a number of important issues. So thank you for the opportunity to join you here today. Thank you to CSIS for hosting this gathering, and I hope you all enjoy the day. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is on the way, uh, but not arrived yet. It's Washington, D.C. There's traffic. <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to refill your coffee cup, we'll get started again in about five minutes. Uh, I should say first, I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the uh, Sumitra Chair for Southeast Asian Studies here at CSIS and, uh, and also co-director of the uh, Pacific Partners Initiative with my colleague Mike Green. Um, but it's, it's just a great pleasure to see such a, such a vibrant crowd here uh, this morning. I think that's due in part to the fact that this may be the, one of the last meetings at CSIS, and then in, in much larger part due to our, our keynote speaker here, uh, Kurt Campbell, who is a, a good friend, a, a former CSISer, and, uh, and really um, an architect of, of what we're talking about today, which is the Asian architecture. Um, as you all know, Kurt, uh, is, uh, has recently left the administration as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, where he did uh, uh, lead the, the team devising the pivot uh, and is responsible for putting in place a lot of the institutions and in architecture or promoting those, uh, those institutions and in architecture. So it's going to be a real treat to have him sort of kick off uh, our discussion today. Kurt is currently chairman and CEO of his new company, the Asia Group. It's an advisory company and investment group specializing in the Asia-Pacific region. He serves as co-chairman of the board for CNAS, uh, the Center for New American Security. And uh, anybody who reads the, the papers, including, I think, especially the Financial Times, will see Kurt's uh, visage up there uh, as a special uh, uh, commentator and, and regular contributor. The rest of his bio is, it goes on now for three or four pages, Kurt, uh, and it's, it's pretty star-studded. But I think uh, most of you in this audience would have, uh, would have had a chance to review that and, and know um, that this man is a strategic leader. Uh, he's a great marketer, uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Kurt Campbell. Um, before I get started, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I agree very much uh, with Ernie's commentary. It's so great to see so many friends here. It's a little bit of a surprise, uh, uh, but it's a wonderful surprise. I will say that as you look at partnerships, 
um, and uh, accomplishment. If you look over the course of the last four or five years, I think the outside institution has played the most important role in helping propel American strategic thinking and engagement in the Asia Pacific region. There's a lot of great think tanks and a lot of great work, but I have to say the person that I found most helpful, uh, most prepared to conspire, uh, most prepared to think creatively, uh, launch new programs to assist in terms of laying out a blueprint for American engagement in Asia was, was Ernie. And I just wanna say publicly how much I appreciated that. And if you look at this, you know, five years ago we did not have these programs. We had nothing on Southeast Asia, very little on architecture, nothing on New Zealand nothing on the future of the U.S. Australian relationship. Ernie built this from scratch. And so before I get started, I'd like to actually just give him a thank you. So, and I, if I can, I, I just, as I get, before I get started, I want to say a word about, about gratitude and what gratitude it feels like in terms of institutions that you've worked with. And so, two of the institutions I've worked most closely with over the last several years, one was CSIS, another is the State Department, just my own personal experience in the last couple of weeks. So, I spoke at the Young Professionals meeting yesterday here at CSIS, was welcomed back in, and literally in the middle of our talk, they are coming in to take the furniture away, okay? <laughs> uh, because they're moving. In the middle of my talk, they're taking away. So that's, that's deep respect, obviously. <laughs> And, and, and secondly, I, went, I made my first trip back to the State Department last week to see the wonderful coronation as ambassador of our good friend, Joe Yoon. And there's a long line of people kind of being ushered into the State Department. Literally, the security guy goes like this to me and goes like that. And I am singled out as the person who needs extra security treatment <laughs> going back to the State Department. So deep respect in the institutions that I've worked beforehand. And, very grateful for that, uh, that, that real sense of my role. So I, I want to spend a little time today to talk a little bit about next steps in institution building in Asia. It's something I know Ernie, CSIS, Mike Green, John Hamry, and people in this room have thought deeply about. And I want to give you at least my thinking. Obviously, Secretary Kerry, uh, our good friend Danny Russell, Evan Medeiros, the president, are thinking about uh, our engagement upcoming at uh, both APEC and the East Asia Summit. But I do think this is an unusually important time with respect to the American role. So if you ask me, what is the most important contribution that the United States can make in Asia over the course of the next several years? You know, is it on the military side? Is it political bilateral engagement? Uh, uh, what is it? I would say twofold. The two most important things that we can do one is to complete the Trans-Pacific Partnership and to set a course for phase two, which I believe can and should uh, engage more of Southeast Asia, and also uh, figure out how our existing game plan for enhanced uh, economic engagement with Southeast Asia and with ASEAN integrates with the TPP process. I would put that as number one. But what I would put as number two would be taken by some perhaps as a surprise. I think the American role and the role of institutions in Asia over the course of the next five to 10 years is the single most important thing with regard to increasing greater trust and confidence, uh, developing uh, uh, more strategic dialogue, and establishing the norms and values of the 21st century. So I can't tell you how important this is, but I don't believe it has gotten the attention it deserves. And I think part of that is because the early uh, genesis of institution building in Asia was thought by many to be frivolous, right? We had performances at the ASEAN Regional Forum, which I've participated in for many years. But what's in fact changed dramatically in the last five years, and there is a lag, not among this group, but among many policymakers in the United States and elsewhere, there's a lag in recognition about how important these sessions at the ASEAN Regional Forum are, at the East Asia Summit, and even at APEC. And the American role in that, along with other uh, countries, is almost uniquely strategic and important. I will tell you that in the past, I was at the ASEAN Regional Forum in its founding in the 1990s. If you compare those meetings to uh, yesterday, you know, uh, 15 years ago, to today, the meetings that took place in Vietnam and Cambodia, they are night and day. And some of the sessions that I've been uh, participant in has been have been as drama-filled, as strategic, and as important 
to larger aims uh, of uh, Asian community building as anything I've ever experienced. And I just want to underscore that more work, more creativity has to be applied in this realm. I think one of the other challenges uh, that has perhaps been um, uh, and uh, a, a subtle block to American strategic thinking about institution building in Asia is to do it effectively. The United States often has to work through other venues. This is not uh, an arena where direct, overt American engagement with, with ideas and policies uh, is always successful. Oftentimes, good ideas have to be uh, advanced through other means, through other players then seconded by yet others, and then a, a subtle uh, American uh, role uh, subsequently. Generally speaking, that's not the way American diplomacy often <laughs> operates, where Americans like to be more out in front. But if you look at the things that have been most successful in terms of institution building, they are places where other leaders, particularly in ASEAN, have taken uh, the leading role, and then other uh, countries and actors have seconded, and again, the United States has played a role, uh, sometimes behind the scenes. To that extent, I have to say a word, uh, if I can, about uh, uh, the transition that has taken place in Australia. We wish the new government well, and we will work very closely uh, uh, with the Prime Minister and his very able team. But it is undeniable that we are going to miss uh, the role of Kevin Rudd. Now, despite personal foibles and you know a complex relationship in Australia, I think in many respects, Kevin Rudd has been the most important strategic thinker uh, uh, in Asia uh, in the last generation, has had an enormous impact on how Americans think about institution building, the role of China, and the like. And he leaves, in a sense, almost ocean vessel size shoes to be filled in terms of play, thinking strategically about Asia. And, and uh, I will tell you that when he would send in strategic you know, sort of notes to the president and the like and to the Secretary of State, his missives, his, uh, um, his uh, uh, insights, uh, perhaps more than any other leader, probably more than any other leader since Lee Kuan Yew during the Vietnam War, got more attention than almost anyone else. He helped us join the East Asia Summit. He helped us think about the fact that the defining feature of modern international relations is China's arrival on the global scene. And every aspect of our diplomacy has to be recreated and recrea recrafted with that uh, in mind. I think it's also the case that he helped us realize that part of what we are seeking to achieve uh, in uh, all of these organizations, and particularly the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum, are um, conversations about, uh, that can best be described as 21st century conversations, 21st century diplomacy around establishing the norms, the values, the mechanisms, and the procedures about how uh, 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 complex issues will be debated, discussed, and uh, uh, hopefully resolved in the Asian Pacific region. And if at all possible, to take us away from what we might, descri might describe as 19th century conversations about spheres of influence, about uh, division, about uh, uh, big powers and small powers and their respective roles. And so I think that is uh, uh, one of the most important things uh, that uh, institution building uh, can do uh, in the period ahead. So how to do that, how to think about that, and what's important in terms of the next steps. Now, the interesting and challenging thing, of course, is that we have a range of institutions, some on the economic side, like APEC, with an enormous membership, uh, uh, and then other organizations with cascading memberships slightly different than the others. Um, I think the subtle role that the United States and other countries can help play is how to create linkages between these organizations in a manner that creates a greater degree of integration, some overlapping integrating concepts. And here, figuring out how the ASEAN Regional Forum and the ASEAN Core within the ASEAN Regional Forum can integrate more effectively within the context of the East Asia Summit. Now, we don't say that often directly, and it's a more subtle uh, set of conversations, but that process is absolutely essential going forward. 
I will also say I think one of the most important things that the United States can do uh, on institution building in Asia really is at the declaratory level. In the past, our position sometimes has been, look, if you want to get together and talk about security and politics and trade on your own, fine. We're, we're agnostic about that. I would take a slightly different view. I believe it is strongly in American security interest with the recognition that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to play out in Asia, right? That we, if there's a big conversation that's integrating, that seeks to build community, we want a seat at the table and we want to be there. And I don't think it hurts anyone. I don't think it causes any anxiety and makes us feel in any way that uh, we are a beggar that we want to be at the table at those conversations. And so I feel much more comfortable with an administration that articulates a role why we want to be at the table. Because trust me, most countries in the region want us to be the table at the table as well. And so at the same time that there are institutions with the United States at the table, and others very important that do not have the United States at the table, I would like to see the onus of innovation and engagement shifting to those organizations uh, with, uh, in which the United States uh, plays an active role. And frankly, to that extent, we need the help of uh, friends in ASEAN, in India, Japan, South Korea, and others. I think it's extraordinarily important to make clear that real institution building on the most important issues involve uh, the United States as well. Uh, I think a second issue that's going to be uh, critical going forward is how we can use the institutions of ASEAN and EAS to better support uh, the views, values, and objectives of ASEAN. And so to that extent, uh, the concepts of integration, of connectivity, again, Ernie's team has done a fantastic job sort of at illuminating what that means. We have to do a better job of understanding what's important to ASEAN and to these institutions and supporting that diplomatically, economically, commercially, and the like. So I think the integration and connectivity theme is important, and I think the United States has a lot uh, to bring to the table there. It is also the case that we want a diversified uh, integration as well. To the extent that we see integration in Southeast Asia, to date it is mostly along a north-south axis. As we go forward, as we develop uh, integration, uh, greater internal cohesion in ASEAN and with surrounding states, we also want to create some east-west connectivity. That means linking India up more consequentially with Thailand uh, uh, through uh, Myanmar and the like. These are things that I think the United States can think creatively about and support going forward. It is also the case that one of the most important things that has to be featured in um, uh, ASEAN, uh, in uh, forums like the East Asia Summit, is to demonstrate that the United States is absolutely committed to working with China, diplomatically, consequentially, and so to do that means not only to highlight high-level diplomacy with China in these venues, and I think we've done a good job there, but then to make sure we have the corresponding diplomacy with the other uh, countries and uh, players in the region. I think that's one of the reasons why it has not been announced, but we're all anticipating an important trip by the president to Southeast Asia. That's critically important, but at the same time that we are uh, meeting with Southeast Asians and others, we have to demonstrate clearly that we are committed to a good relationship with China. This is not just because of that uh, goal in and of itself, but it is a, it is a fact that ASEAN and other countries want a good relationship between the United States and China, uh, and that they are better able to build their own relations uh, with uh, the United States in a context of greater uh, engagement between uh, Beijing and Washington. As part of that effort, I will tell you one of the areas that we struggled with, quite frankly, were establishing um, programs and projects where the United States and China could actually work together on the ground. Uh, whether it was in Timor on water purification or agriculture assistance or um, uh, assisting countries with dealing with uh, creating capacity to respond uh, to humanitarian emergencies. We've worked very hard to try to come up with projects where the United States and China could demonstrate clearly and openly that we're prepared to work together. 
Now, we were careful not to talk very much about this in public because, frankly, we wanted to see China step up and join with us. Now, it's been hard, and I think we need to make clear now more publicly how much we're prepared, and we want to put an agenda out there so that, so that friends in ASEAN understand that we're not in any way anxious about this. We support that, and we want China to join with us. And that actual project of working together, building habits of cooperation between the United States and China could not be more important. In addition to the obvious engagements that we're going to have with ASEAN as a whole, I think it is also the case that as we go forward, we want to bring in other actors who have critical uh, uh, areas of knowledge and experience uh, that can be applied in this institution uh, building context. Too often, I have to take um, some blame for this. Initially, the perception was that when we were thinking more about Asia, that we were somehow leaving Europe behind. That is, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you look at everything that the United States has ever done, ever done of consequence in foreign policy in the last 60 years, we have done it with Europe, right? Every single thing. And the truth is Europe is also thinking more about Asia. One of the most important things that the United States and Europe can do is to advance our cooperation in Asia and to work more consequentially on those issues. Of course, we have critical areas that we have to work on, on Syria, on Egypt, and on Iran, but we must make the time and devote the energy to creating a cadre of people in the United States and Europe who are more focused on Asia. One of the areas that Europeans have almost unique experience is building institutions among countries that have historical challenges. And if you look at where Europe started before CSCE, the uh, other institutions that were built in the 1960s and 70s, and where they are today, it is inconceivable the progress that has been made. Europe can help in the process of institution building in ASEAN, in Asia uh, going forward. And the United States needs to work with uh, ASEANs uh, and Europe on that endeavor. Um, one of the things that my good friend Vikram uh, here at the table has worked very hard on is the role of the military in these uh, uh, endeavors. I think we have seen some remarkable uh, uh, innovation in the last several months on the part of our Department of Defense, asking defense ministers uh, from around ASEAN to come to the United States. Uh, the uh, the uh, defense ministers' meetings uh, that take place on a uh, every two-year basis. I think there are plans for different kinds of engagement. There is a military and security com component to the ASEAN Regional Forum. We need to ensure that the, that there is more interaction among military operations in Asia, military organizations. It is not realistic to expect that we will anytime soon arrive at a circumstance where there is some out of area commitment or larger commitment on the part of an organization to intervene or to respond to security challenges. There just is not the trust and confidence in Asia to do that. However, uh, security organizations in Asia that are multifaceted, that include the United States, ASEAN, and China, and India, have the opportunity to support more transparency so there is a greater sense of what countries are up to in terms of strategy and military developments and also areas of common purpose, whether it be disaster response or the like, and uh, also to seek what's possible with respect to confidence building going forward. Um, I, I want to um, I, I want to conclude with just a couple of uh, general observations, then whatever Ernie wants in terms of questions, I'm happy to do. I think one of the things that we have to make very clear going forward is that we have a strong interest and we support ASEAN unity. And, and we want the ASEAN project uh, enunciated so clearly uh, in 2015 to continue. And we believe that one of the foundational pieces of peace and stability in Asia is an ASEAN that is united. And that uh, if ASEAN ever found itself in a set of circumstances where it was divided fundamentally uh, over an extended period of time, uh, I believe that would not be in the interest of the United States or of other countries in the region as a whole. 
Now, many people point to what happened in Cambodia as a, a very dark and uh, a dangerous set of developments when there was a lack of ability to come up with uh, a unified approach on some complex issues associated with maritime security. I take a different approach to that. I think that is signs of a growing organization. It is not the case that, that, that the organization will then go backwards from here. Any organization that has not grappled with hard organizations is not a serious organization. And ASEAN is becoming a very serious component of uh, Asian integration. And so I fully expect that the process that was triggered through this kind of open debate will lead to a more healthy organization, which fundamentally addresses uh, in a, a positive way what goals and ambitions for ASEAN going forward. Um, I do believe that uh, this is an area, uh, institution building in Asia, where the United States has some unique uh, uh, roles to play. We're a distant power, but I think in many respects we do have a strong alignment with the larger goals of the regional actors and the institutions as a whole. And I can't tell you how, again, how grateful I am to see such a strong turnout for what I think is and will be a signature set of initiatives for the 21st century. I'll stop here, Ernie, and then however you want to proceed. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, why don't you stay there, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, open the floor to a couple questions. We've got, a, we've got about 10 minutes. Al, you're first. Al Laporta, State Department, retired. Uh, Kurt, I think we've discussed this but has, have you seen any evolution of any thinking as far as kind of the asymmetry between Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia and where Northeast Asian integration or consultative mechanism might be a uh, Southeast Asia has is ASEAN centric, uh, is developing a whole range of useful in institutions and in political security, and hopefully more toward economic integration. APEC is there on the economic side to some extent, but still there's a kind of a large hole in Northeast Asia insofar as a lack of mechanisms. Some uh, in uh, government have said, well, the logical next step uh, in Northeast integration depends on the six-party process and what happens to the DPRK. Um, uh, we've also seen on the negative side that China, uh, uh, South Korea, Japan integration, uh, especially on the economic side, hasn't gone anywhere. So w what kind of thinking would you apply to Northeast Asia? It's an important question, and it's, I think, very valuable. And there have been times in the past where there has been some important strategic thinking about whether we'd have a five-party meeting or you know, some way to uh, uh, get uh, the larger powers to talk about the future of Northeast Asia. I think we have to be honest that the, that the current obstacles to, uh, uh, to a more fulsome set of discussions in Northeast Asia are real. Uh, and large. Uh, we have uh, uh, a, uh, an uncertain situation in North Korea. Uh, it's not clear how they would respond uh, to uh, a five-party meeting. Uh, I'm not sure China would support such an, such an initiative at this time. I think more important and uh, more difficult is the relationship between both Japan and South Korea and Japan and China. Uh, and I'm not sure in the current environment there is the appetite for uh, a larger multilateral effort, which in the best of circumstances carries high stakes with it. So I'm outside of government now. So if I, if I would give advice, I think the more important component pieces are the, bi are the, are the critical bilateral relationships. So I would very much encourage uh, 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 careful uh, dialogue between Japan and South Korea and uh, Japan and China on a variety of issues, but making clear all along that the United States has a strong interest 
in how these conversations go and that they take place. So that means a very active American role in South Korea uh, dialogue with Japan as it goes through its important changes and of course the relationship with China. I, I think the, um, it is not lost on any of us that one of the most worrisome things that we're dealing with right now is the unpredictable quality of the diplomacy between Japan and China. And uh, that is exacerbated by the circumstances around disputed islands, the Senkaku, the Dayutai. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, we would like to see a situation in which you have a larger uh, engagement uh, in Northeast Asia about the critical issues that economically and politically that confront the region as a whole. But um, I think we have to recognize that at, at the current time, it's probably, there is a ripeness issue, and there probably are some proceeding steps that need to take place uh, in advance. Kurt, I want to take the prerogative of the sure. chair and, and follow up on this. What, you, you've focused on the, the importance of ASEAN. Could you, talk, could you say what you think uh, Indonesia can do in that, in that context, yeah. and what, what have they done? What, what can we expect from Indonesia, or I, what I, should we expect? It's, it's a great question. I'm sorry, you know, the truth is I should have touched on this. If, if you look at the country that has played the most important role um, in uh, agenda setting, strategic dialogue in Asia uh, over the course of the last couple of years, I think a number of votes would be cast for Indonesia. They have played a remarkable role. And what I have seen in, with my own eyes is, you know, there has always been a caution to the diplomacy that exists between the United States and Indonesia. But through very hard work, I saw trust and confidence build between Foreign Minister Marty and Secretary Clinton and, and other counterparts. And we saw Indonesia do the most difficult of things. It played a role as a, a staunch supporter and member of ASEAN. Uh, but uh, it is also at the same time uh, playing a, a role as a leading state in Asia both as a member of the G20, Ernie, but also in a country in its own standing. And so it has played a role uh, both to support ASEAN, but occasionally, when necessary, to speak out in an individual role in a leadership manner. Much in the way that you know, Kevin Rudd assisted us in some of our diplomacy and Julia Gillard, and we expect that to continue in Australia, I think we have to recognize that some of that diplomacy can be attributed to the remarkable role that SBY has played in the region as a whole on so many issues, climate change, institutional uh, innovation and the like. And we want that process to continue, but we recognize that it is still on a foundation that is uh, being, if you will, fleshed out. So I think the Ernie's general point is we have come to rely, all of us, on Indonesia's leading role in uh, ASEAN at a time of fundamental transformation in the organization as a whole. Time for one more question uh, right here at uh, the table. Michael Clark, LMIC Global. Uh, I was happily struck by your point about we have to give better signals to China and Asia about cooperation. But it's my understanding that there's, at least academically there's a strong view in China that cooperation in the United States and global governance is not in China's best interest because of, of two reasons. Um, but the most important one is it, it sucks China into the Western-style government, and there's a big academic argument that there is an Eastern style that they should be following. I'd just like your comments if, if that is a problem. guys. I'm sorry. I'm certainly familiar with those debates within China, but I, I would simply say that, that the uh, arguments or answers that begin with either uh, what does China want or this is what China wants, I think don't reflect uh, that on many of the critical issues there is a robust, uh, there remains robust debate. And um, just as there are uh, discussions about you know, China's role in the world and the most recent innovation really is Xi Jinping's uh, determination to reflect to China as a great power and not to, not to um, 
uh, resist that, right? And I think with that is a recognition as a great power that comes both advantages and some responsibilities. I think previously China had perhaps been more interested in, in being described as a great power when it is, was in their interest, but perhaps as a developing country when, um, when perhaps more burdens uh, were in play. I, I personally do not believe that China will reject uh, a, uh, efforts to work with the United States and other countries, because I think many of the things that we're talking about are not as value-laden as you described. Um, the notion of greater capacity in uh, agriculture or dealing with humanitarian crises or preparing for how to deal with um, piracy, these are things that affect all of the countries of Asia, and Asians want to see practical cooperation, and they want to see countries leading forward there. And so I think that if the United States is sustained in our effort and making clear that we're prepared to work on the definition of how this cooperation goes forward, um, to be sincere in our effort in doing it, uh, to not just talk to the foreign ministry but other aspects of the Chinese government, I think we will have success there. I have no doubt that there are both bureaucratic impediments, some concerns about how the leadership will address these things. But I would simply say it was uh, taken as an article of, of fact four months ago that the only kind of meetings that ever would happen between the United States and China were either those institutions that involved all the bells and whistles, you know, state summits, which are high stakes, difficult, hard to plan, or the rushed, always unsatisfying 30 minute that turned into an hour and 30 minutes and we're rushing through the agenda at multilateral summits. It was basically one or the other. And then a decision taken really by the Chinese leadership that we're ready for a sit down and really without a lot of, you know, bells and whistles to run through the agenda in a um, productive way. Now that meeting was tough, a lot of hard issues on cybersecurity and the like, but that sets a very clear message that, that China is interested in constructive cooperation with the United States. I think the key here is, is how the case is made and how it's sustained. If the United States doesn't, our, our problem is often that we have one idea one year and the next year we're off to a different idea. We have to be sustained in this effort over a series of years, but we need help from ASEAN. We need ASEAN to make clear to both us and to the Chinese what their expectations are. They want to see manifestations of U.S.-China cooperation on the ground in ASEAN, in Timor, in the Pacific, and elsewhere, demonstrating that both sides are prepared to take the political risks and do the hard work to build actual true cooperation. Not just talk about it, not just debate about what a great new strategic relationship is, but actually to do real on the ground productive uh, cooperation. Um, I believe with that kind of larger um, framework uh, of reinforcement, we have a very good chance in accomplishing that, despite the inevitable debates about China's role and American staying power that are occurring in China today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.